We're going to shift gears now and move away from metals. Uh, and we're going to start talking about another class of materials that we've mentioned before, and that's polymers. So all I really want to do in this lecture is just give you a real brief introduction, um, uh, kind of before we get into the nitty gritty and just talk about what, what polymers are and, and uh, how they're put together. So first off, let's just answer the question, what is a polymer? And so I'm showing you here, I split the word into, into two parts, poly and myrrh. And they both come from Greek roots. Um, uh, poly just means many, and myrrh comes from the Greek that means parts. So it's just a, a molecule that's, or a material that's composed of many parts, but we're going to define that more carefully. So typically a poly, polymer is going to be a long chain molecule that has repeating chain, uh, a, a repeating chain of atoms that's held together by covalent bonds. Um, most often this chain is made up of carbon atoms. This, this forms the backbone is what we would call it. Uh, although sometimes you can have silicon atoms also forming the backbone. So let me give you some examples of uh, uh, polymers. So one that's very common is polyethylene. And so what you can see here is that you have a, a chain of carbon atoms. This blue region is highlighting what would be the repeating unit cell. Um, it just continues on. And so it constructs this chain and it could go off for, for very long. Uh, and, and so you have both the repeat unit, the part, as well as the polymer, the, 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 the complete molecule. Another example is PVC, polyvinyl chloride. And the only difference between poly, polyvinyl chloride and polyethylene is that one of these hydrogen atoms that's attached to the carbons is replaced by a chlorine atom. And then another example of, of again, of a common material is polypropylene. And in that case, it, rather than a hydrogen here or a chlorine, like in the case of PVC, we have a CH3 group uh, that's bonded there to form polypropylene. And so that's the repeating unit that forms that. Okay, so that's that's really the, the kind of the most basic uh, um, way to think about polymers. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about where the you know where have they come from. Uh, so and this is mostly just for fun. I'm not going to quiz you of whether you memorize this or not. Um, but we can kind of break polymers into natural polymers and synthetic polymers. And I think you'll be a little surprised it's, that synthetic polymers didn't come about until quite recently, really. Uh, whereas natural polymers have been used for a very long time. So one example of a natural polymer would be cotton, and it's been used at least since 6000 BC. Um, a similar uh, polymer would be wool uh, and then leather also used uh, extensively very early on, you know, uh, seven, eight thousand years ago. Uh, another fun one, uh, the pitch that uh, the Bible records being smeared on Noah's Ark is an example of a polymer. Uh, silk probably began to be used about 4000 BC. It's another example of a polymer. And even rubber uh, was used around 1600 BC. This is actually a ball that uh, I think that they recovered from the Mayans. Uh, they would apparently had some game that they would play with it. So uh, natural polymers have been being used for, for the better part of 8000 years. Um, but the very first synthetic polymer that we see didn't occur until 1869, and it was invented by John Wesley Hyatt. And it was invented as a replacement for the ivory used in billiard balls. Apparently, the billiard ball, uh, the game of billiards, uh, had had become quite popular and had put a put a lot of pressure on the ivory trade. So he was trying to find uh, um, uh, an alternative material to make billiard balls with. So that's that came about by treating cellulose with camphor. Um, the first uh, f fully synthetic plastic was uh, called uh, Bakelite, um, and it was a substitute f originally for, uh, for an electrical insulator uh, called shellac, but uh, they, there's lots of things that were made, of, made from it after it was created. Uh, a common one would be just a, an old telephone. Uh, and then finally, one that... Uh, had a influence on our performance in World War II, actually, was the development of nylon as a replacement for silk in war parachutes, ropes, uh, helmet liners, and other things. So, uh, you know, basically over 3,000 years <laughs> between kind of the use of, uh, we have rubber being used in 1600 BC, but before we can create our own polymers, it's over 3,000 years. So uh, anyway, kind of just an interesting history of that. Um, and you'll see that they, they are a little bit uh, a little bit more unique, I think, than uh, materials that you're used to dealing with in terms of what they're uh, 
what their uh, properties can can look like. So let's talk about how they're made. Um, they're formed through a process called polymerization. And what that is, is we have a, a single repeat unit that's called a monomer, and it reacts to form linear chains or a 3D network of chains. So let me just give you an example. I'm not, you know, we'll, we'll talk more about polymerization later, but this is just a, a real brief example of how it, how it happens. So uh, this will be the free radical polymerization of a polyethylene. And there's other forms of polymerization besides free radical, but this is just one example. So the way it works is that we have uh, a free radical here reacting with a monomer. In this case, it's ethylene. And it's going to react to form, uh, it's going to bond on this end of the chain and then leave uh, an unbonded electron. And so this little dot represents an unbonded electron. The double bonded carbon is actually unstable compared to a single bonded carbon. So it, um, it, it uh breaks that bond, it forms with the carbon-carbon bond, and then it leaves an unbonded electron at the end, which is now free to go uh, merge with another monomer. Uh, and that's that occurs in a process called propagation. So there's basically two phases. There's an initiation phase and there's a propagation phase. Okay. Um, so so that's that kind of is how they come about. And then the final... Um, the final product of polymerization of polyethylene is, is what you see here, this repeating chain unit, just like I showed you in the very uh, first slide. Uh, so there's our repeat unit and it forms uh, these chains. And if you look at it in 3D, there's our carbon atoms and then we have hydrogen atoms kind of spiking off of them uh, in this fashion. The, the interesting thing about polymers is that the same polymer can be dramatically different in terms of properties and uses depending on uh, other features besides simply the chemistry. So unlike steel, where we if we can tell you the composition of steel, um, and we know the modulus exactly because it's governed by the bonding of the iron atoms, um, in this case, uh, it, it's it's very different because we, we are, um, uh, there are more potential characteristics in play for these. So one example would be uh, this polyethylene in particular, and it's called ultra high molecular weight polyethylene, is actually used in body armor. Um, it's one of the best things that exists today for, uh, pr for uh, protection against uh, in bulletproof vests and things like that. It's also used in things if you're um, like an off-roader, uh, some of the higher end toe straps are made of polyethylene that but, uh, usually it's called ultra high molecular weight polyethylene and we'll talk more about what molecular weight um, uh, how that pertains to a polymer but in the short chain case of polyethylene it can be used for paraffin wax to actually make candles so obviously very different uses you you don't really think of wax as something you'd like to use as an as a protective armor if a bullet was coming at you so we're going to talk a little bit about why those um, why those differences come about okay uh, the next thing we want to just mention before, just as part of the introduction here, is we want to talk about just how do we characterize polymers. So one one feature that's important, obviously, is the chemistry. And so nothing in the previous exa uh, uh, example of armor versus paraffin wax, uh, uh, nothing was different in the chemistry. They were both polyethylene molecules represented by this 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 sort of schematic here on the right. But there are some other features that are important in polymers that uh, they are they do differ in. One of them is size, and we'll characterize that as molecular weight. So uh, a short uh, chain is going to behave differently than a long chain. Uh, another feature that is important to to uh, quantify with respect to polymers is their shape. And there's a lot of ways to characterize shape, but uh, something, some, you know, examples would be chain twisting, entanglement, and that's what I'm showing you here. You know, this is sort of the backbone that, that, uh, that exists, but these radii that are being drawn are ways that those atoms could orient themselves and still maintain their angle. And so this is giving you one type of, uh, polymer, and this is giving you another shape of polymer, and they're going to behave differently based on their shapes. And then the final characteristic that we want to talk about is called structure. And that's just whether whether a, um, a polymer is linear, which is uh, shown here, uh, just sort of chains that are that lie beside each other, whether those chains are branched 
kind of interacting with each other. They have little side branches, whether they're cross-linked, where they're actually bonded, or whether they form this sort of network. Uh, it'll, I'm showing you it in 2D, but it's really a 3D network of chains. So those are the four characteristics that we want to talk about, and that'll be the focus of our, of our next lecture.